I have heard that they're serving cocktails in the lobby <laughs> and that a certain number of you have partaken of this. Is that, raise your hand, who's guilty? Uh, God bless you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, this is Rachel Maddow. Welcome, Rachel. <laughs> I, well, it's not coming up on my screen, so somebody will get it for me. Ah, there it is. Okay. I, and I'm David Remnick, editor of The New Yorker. And this is the, it's really hard for me to believe, but this is the 25th New Yorker Festival. And we are entering year 100 of the existence of the magazine. And, and knock on wood, another 100 years for us. Um, on behalf of the magazine, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Rachel I, if I have to tell you who she is and what she's done, you don't deserve to be here. <laughs> but I, I do want to say that she has been a, um, a clarion voice, um, a, a clarifying voice um, for years now on, on radio, in, in books, and of course on MSNBC. And she's someone I admire for her intelligence and the uniqueness of her ability to tell a story, in fact, and she's also an extraordinary human being, just an incredibly kind and decent person. I, I couldn't be more thrilled to have you here. So, thank you. A little piece of business. Before we begin, there's a quick reminder to please silence your cell phones. Uh, refrain from, does anybody take flash photography anymore? Well, don't. <laughs> and if you're inclined to post on social media, well, then God bless you. Um, the festival hashtag is New Yorker Fest. We've got about an hour together, including time at the end for questions. Those questions will magically appear on this screen because you will have texted them in uh, to the number that's, is it behind me? Yeah? Okay, good. You, so you know what to do. And we, will, we really will have time for your questions and we want to hear them, and I know Rachel does. Um, this event would not be possible without your support. Um, I don't mean to be too presumptuous, but I mean New Yorker subscribers. So thank you. Thank you. Those few of you who don't subscribe for your children, your grandchildren, your nephews, nieces, and all those people, the way to do it is to go to newyorker.com and proceed from there, and I would appreciate that too. So without further ado, let, let us start. Rachel, let's start with something incredibly cheerful. About a mile up the road <laughs> at Madison Square Garden, I could tell because on the subway down here I was surrounded by, by people who were not going here, alas, but going to Madison Square Garden. You could tell by the hats. Um, something very um, ominous is occurring. There's a, a rally, a, a MAGA rally, a Trump rally at Madison Square Garden, and the resonance of it are obvious, um, or maybe not so obvious, but I, I'd like you to describe what you think the resonances are of that rally at Madison Square Garden. So lots of things have happened at Madison Square Garden. Um, it is, I think, it, it's telling that when Trump announced it, immediately people started talking about February 1939 and the German-American Bund holding their their rally there, which I want to say was infamous, or their very famous rally there, it actually wasn't that well known. It wasn't sort of a cultural touchstone um, in American life until fairly recently. Um, there was a beautiful short film that was made about it that raised the um, raised awareness about it. But also, people just started talking about it and citing it and incorporating it, incorporating it into our our popular history of what's happened in this city and in this country in the past century. And that historical presence of that Bund rally is itself an interesting thing. Because I think 10 years ago or 15 years ago, most Americans would not have known that happened. And now we find that Trump is doing one of these final closing argument rallies and he's doing it there and we all think of that. So it tells you kind of where our heads are. It also tells you, I think, something important about history, which is that we tell ourselves the stories from our history that we think we need today. Um, so, we're talking a lot about authoritarianism, fascism, we're talking a lot about Hitler, we're talking a lot about stuff that 
was considered to be off the deep end in terms of mainstream electoral discussion not that long ago, but we're doing it because we are trying to grasp and put in real context the threat that this very new type of American politician represents in 2024. So I, I, am, I am not afraid of the Madison Square Garden rally. Um, I think, you know, like I said, a lot of stuff has happened there. In 2004, Madison Square Garden is where the Republicans all wore um, Band-Aids as a joke to mock John Kerry's war wounds. Uh, 1964, um, actually this date, 1964, 60 years ago today, was um, Barry Goldwater's closing argument rally before the 1964 election in which he railed against desegregation, got a 28-minute standing ovation, and proclaimed that he was about to win the presidency in the greatest upset in the history of American politics. He did not. Ten years before that, in 1954, there was a huge rally, 13,000 people at the Garden, um, to try to head off the censure of Joe McCarthy. And Roy Cohn spoke at that, and Gerald L.K. Smith, one of America's all-time Hall of Fame anti-Semites, was there. William F. Buckley was there. Members of Congress were there. Um, it was organized, in terms of the crowd, organized in large part by the National Renaissance Party, which was a uniformed stormtrooper-style Nazi militia that wore swastika armbands. So Madison Square Garden is at its moments. Um, and you may choose one of these analogies instead of the 39 rally. Um, but it, I think it tells you something about where our heads are at, that those are the kinds of things we're looking for. We're certainly not thinking about the Knicks, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but when you watch Marshall Curry's short film, I think it's about seven minutes long, and it involves the head of the German-American Bund speaking, and by the way, being attacked by a counter-demonstrator, and then he's, this guy's beaten into submission. What's amazing is the stagecraft is right out of what would be Le a Leni Reifenstahl movie. It was Nazism, people wearing armbands, doing the Nazi salute, the rest. If you were to propose this to Donald Trump, he would say, oh, come on, get over it. I was president from 2016 to 2020. This business of fascism and authoritarianism is just wildly overblown. What say you? I mean, the, the thing about Curry's film that I think made it land so viscerally is that it seemed really foreign, right? I mean, the, the film is, features Fritz Kuhn, who was the head of the German-American Bund, who did want fashion himself, wanted to be America's Fuhrer. Um, part of the problem, the reason he never did, is because he spoke with an unpenetrably thick German-American accent. It just kind of put people off a little bit. It was very reassuring. It was reassuring <laughs> in a way. Oh, this is a foreign thing. But actually, if you look at Ken Burns's film on America and the Holocaust, um, he features not just footage of Kuhn, but also of other figures in the German-American Bund who did not have accents at all, and who were preaching the same anti-Semitic bile. And part of our dissonance there is, how is this America? This seems like such a foreign thing. The C but then you see the George Washington uh, banners that are hanging on the opposite sides of the, the stage. Actually, the National Renaissance Party, that group that I just referenced from the 1954 rally at the Garden, the, the leader of the National Renaissance Party published a book titled George Washington, or excuse me, <laughs> Adolf Hitler, um, Europe's George Washington. All right, so there's, there's this effort to take foreign fascism and make it seem American, and, and our dissonance there is in, you know, ca how can this possibly be homegrown? But I feel like what's more helpful to me, the sort of better, I don't know if it's analogy or touchstone or what the right word is, but knowing that, you know, Italian fascism was the most Italian thing possible. German fascism was the most German thing possible. Spanish fascism was the most Spanish thing possible. And American fascism would not be foreign. It would be uber patriotic. It would be nationalist in a purely American sense. It would not have an accent. And that is the core. I mean, fascism is nationalism at its core. It's part, it's not, that's, it's not sufficient, but it's necessary. And, you know, Hitler and Mussolini 
you know, they did favors one another. They got along, but they rejected the idea that either of them had imported anything across bound boundaries because everything had to seem like it was of the nation, for the nation. And when we talk about making America great again, and we talk about the threat of an authoritarian takeover in the United States in the form of Trumpism, it is not something foreign. It is something that's coming from a fascist place that is a recurring ebbing and, and waning, uh, um, ebbing and flowing tide that we face in, we've faced in multiple generations. Is Donald Trump a fascist? Yes. Um, Liz, to reassure you, Liz Cheney said the same thing sitting in that well, chair yesterday. Liz Cheney and I obviously have always agreed on everything. Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, mean, we I thought go, that was true. We go way back. I mean, but I, if, he's, you know, if he's a fascist, is he a self-conscious one? I don't think it matters. I mean, I, th I think that Robert Paxton's definition of, of fascism is the most useful, and he describes sort of the messaging that brings fascists to power and then what happens once fascists are in power. And I think Paxton's key insight was to say, um, their policies don't matter. <laughs> like, they're, they're, what they say they want to do with government doesn't matter, and they never hold to what they say they're going to do with government. And so if you can cite, sort of set that aside and look at the way they claim power, it's almost always the same messaging. It is, we are a nation in decline. We used to be great. We're no longer great. We have been humiliated. Everybody's laughing at us. We've been victimized by traitors within, stab in the back. Who has sold us out? Who, is the expl who, who provides the explanation for why we are no longer great? Well, it's an all-powerful enemy that is within that we need to root out, and normal tactics don't work against them. It's somebody, it's a group that is among us and also above us, and they're scheming against us, and we need to turn our force against them. The immigrants, the liberals, the Jews, whatever, whoever you want your scapegoat to be. And once you've defined this superhuman enemy that has ruined the nation, that needs to be opposed, well, you can't do that with electoral politics. You can't do that with democracy, because what is democracy? Democracy is the process by which we all, as equal citizens, participate in a group decision about what's going forward. We can't, uh, about what we want going forward. You can't have that if there's an enemy among us who is subverting everything that's great about this nation. They can't participate. And so therefore, we can't use democratic means. We're in an emergency situation. We need an extraordinary means. Maybe we'll get democracy back someday, but we can't use it now. And you know what? It might have to get a little bloody. We might need a little bit of violence just to save the nation just this once. And when you've sold that, and you've sold always alongside it, that journalists are the enemy, that science is the enemy, that there's no such thing as facts, that the leader has, an, has a will and instincts that are not fact-checkable, that are just true because he embodies the nation, then what you end up with is a cult of personality with untrammeled power, with no source of power other than that which derives from the leader, where the only way that anybody else gets anything in the society or in the government is by untrammeled loyalty to the leader. And then you get eliminationist violence toward the scapegoat, and then it's the end. And it's the same message everywhere. It's the same stupid, simple, satisfying, pacifying, problem everywhere, no matter what accent you speak it in. And the result is always the same. And so whether you're promising to build a wall or whether you're promising to regain your colonies, the message appeals in a powerful, guttural way that I think we haven't contended with very well. You wrote a book called Prequel. You wrote it with a purpose. You titled it with a purpose. Yeah, Tell a little, me about a little on the nose with the title. I know that's fine, and it, and and came out to to some degree, I think, out of the podcast Ultra as well. Tell me about the generation of that book and its your intent, because you could have chosen to write any number of books. You chose that. I um, I want us to understand previous fights with fascism, domestic fascism in this country, not because I want to make us feel like, oh, we're never going to beat this thing, but because I want us to be proud that we have beat it in the past, 
and I want the Americans who were good at fighting previous generations of fascists to be famous. And almost none of them are. In prequel and in um, Ultra, this podcast that I've done a couple series of, um, almost none of the good guys are people anybody has heard, have heard of. And I'm, tr I'm just trying to, I'm their PR agent. I'm going back <laughs> and finding dead anti-fascists in American history who did good work. In order and to I'm inspire to make them new known. ones. In order, well, in order to learn from them, you know? It's, it's uh, copy their work. It, you know, it worked then, it might work now, try it again. What's radically different between the, the history described in prequel and the history that we're living through now is that in prequel, the bad guys are plenty powerful. Henry Ford, huge industrialist, um, Charles Coughlin, Father Coughlin had how many listeners on a given night? 30 million? I mean, at a time we only had awesome. 130 million people in the country. He was getting 20 and 30 million people listening to him. So weekly. more than Tucker Carlson. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think um, inarguably the, the most dominant media figure there's ever been in American history. But they weren't president of the United States. That seems to be the, the, the elemental difference between prequel and sequel. <laughs> um, what are the origins of Donald Trump in your view? In other words, if, if you grew up here, he was an 80s figure in the jokescape of New York life. He was a kind of seedy, skeezy real estate dealer who was on the phone to the New York Post every day of his life. He wanted to be famous. He wanted to be rich. He didn't play by the rules. He was kind of funny. He'd be on the cover of Spy magazine. It was the, he was that figure. And now he's this figure. How did that happen and why? I'm going to say something that is not nice, um, which is that I don't care about Donald Trump as a person at all. I mean, I care about him as, you know, um, I care about him as my fellow man. Like, I think we all, you know, need to recognize the humanity in everyone. Up to a point. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I don't, I mean, you know, failed watercolorist or whatever Hitler was, right? Like Benito Mussolini, like small fry journalist. Okay, you know, uh, do I care? I don't care. I don't think it's the most important thing about them. Are there things in their individual biographies that might explain why they developed the yen that they had to try to become strong men, leaders and oppressors? Uh, maybe. Um, what, what, I, what I think is the importance of Trump is his message. So he's telling, he's, uh, you know, I, 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 will, I will protect you. But if, I can interrupt, Rachel. For, forgive yeah. me. What I mean is the social conditions that allowed him to be it. In other words, wait, wait, wait. If you looked at it, it in the case of Hitler, there's the Treaty of Versailles, the humiliation post the First World War, economic conditions, Weimar, all that. What's the analogy here? There isn't one. I don't, I don't think that authoritarianism rises out of economic conditions. I think that there are complicated, difficult, and in, in, in some cases in, uh, incredibly oppressive economic and social conditions that give rise to all sorts of things. The question is whether or not authoritarianism will rise. And authoritarianism rises because you get a talented demagogue who uses the constant grievances that are always there and channels them into a simple solution. I will take care of you. I will be your protector. All of these things in politics that vex you and that you worry about and that we've been fighting about for so long, you will no longer have to worry about them. You will no longer have to think about them. They will be settled. You will not have to vote again. You, the people who annoy you and who make you uncomfortable and who disagree with you will disappear. And the really vexatious ones, the ones who really bug you, we may execute them on television and it'll be fun. It is a future in which Politics doesn't exist because the good guys won and they're going to rule forever. And you can sell that to people who are in great need of relief economically or, or socioeconomically or, or who have faced various kinds of oppression. But you can also apparently sell it to billionaires. And it is that, that strongman message um, has always worked to a certain degree on everybody who's had it sold to them, including the United States, including Americans. Um, 
this one happened to latch on to the power of a political party that did not have defenses to gatekeep a force like this. And um, by, hatching, by latching itself on to the Republican Party, by the Republican Party capitulating almost entirely to it, he rode that as a vehicle to the but, pinnacle but, of but American something, power. But something happened in those debates in 2016 in the Republican Party and resulted in him blowing away the opposition through whatever you want to call the primary system, democratic means, semi-democratic means, why? Because of the power of the message. I mean, this, I, I know I'm a, a little bit of a broken record here, but I feel like the thing that we're not contending with is why people like the idea of this simple solution. Why is the idea of winning permanently so much more attractive to us as Americans than being engaged in the beautiful, contentious struggle of democracy, which never ends and never has a f permanent winner. That, that, I, that's the story that we're in the middle of. And, uh, you know, not being good at contending with this type of an opponent in the political field is a political problem. Um, having 16 different guys who all kind of looked the same if you squinted running against Donald Trump who looked very different was probably not an awesome strategy for the Republican Party in 2016. Um, but, but there have been demagogues or would be demagogues who have risen, you know, X to X height in American power in the past, but they've usually been gatekeeped out of the top job. And that's not happening with this Republican Party. You, you say in the book that there are four things to watch for in, in, in this struggle, um, in this desire to destroy democracy. Um, the first is voting. The second is scapegoating. Third is violence. The fourth is disinformation or attacks on the truth. That sounds fairly familiar. Yeah. Can you ad address that as a coherent strategy? Well, it's, I mean, I, I'm, there are people who are lifelong scholars of democracy and, and authoritarian movements who are better at this than me. For this is sort of my personal cheat sheet in terms of what you look for in a democracy that's in trouble. And the first is whether there is, um, uh, there's, wh whether the, the polity, whether the, the group of people who's supposed to be voting to determine the future of the democratic country um, can have, an, can have faith in our democratic system and whether they do have it, whether it's appropriate to have it. Are people, A, voting, are their votes being counted as they were cast, and two, do people believe that elections are real and that that's the way that we make decisions in this country? That's the first thing to watch for is the sort of wobbliness around the technical processes of democracy. Second thing to watch for is violence um, making its way into the political sphere when you start to see different political factions have paramilitary units. Um, when people are afraid to do normal political things like vote or like demonstrate peacefully or um, work as a poll worker because they're afraid of violence. Um, the third is um, when you see scapegoating, um, there's almost always Almost always, 99.9% .9 of the time, there is an element of anti-Semitism that goes with it, but with or without anti-Semitism, it is the identification of an enemy that is the explanation for all things that are wrong. Have you noticed in the campaign right now, no matter what you ask Trump, the answer is immigrants? How will you pay for childcare? Immigrants! You know, how will you, uh, what will you do about Ukraine? Immigrants! The, the, it, it, when you come up with a scapegoated population, usually a disfavored or minority population, um, that can be used as the shorthand answer for anything that's wrong. That's a warning sign. But then the last is this idea that, um, and this is the part that sounds really woo-woo, but I think it is, I think it is not woo-woo, I assert, um, which is the idea that uh, journalists, scientists, and people who bring you factual information are enemies and that there are no real facts and you can't trust them. And I know that sounds woo-woo, I know that sounds like psychology where the other parts, the other things sound like politics, but the way that works really functionally is if you don't believe that there's any knowable facts and that you have access to factual information, what do you go on instead? You go with your gut or you go with those you trust. The leader will tell you what to think 
how to react, how to feel, and just go with it because there's no way to check what he's saying. And when, when you see all of those four sort of cornerstones of democracy, you see any one of them getting wobbly, you should worry. When all four of them start wobbling, you, your democracy is at risk of coming to an end. And we have a really old democracy. And, um, and we're going to have to make a hard decision about it right now. You, you referenced billionaires earlier. The richest person in the country, I think the richest person in the world, Elon Musk has already established his uh, bona fides within MAGA, jumping up in the air, um, contributing tens of millions of dollars. Um, the other day, I think is the second wealthiest person in the country and in the world, Jeff Bezos um, decided it would not be a good idea for the Washington Post, which he owns, to publish a endorsement essay, which no one had any illusions about. Uh, endorsement essays rarely, whether we publish them or anybody else, hardly sway uh, tens of millions of voters, but they're a means of providing a cogent case one way or another, uh, whether it's about incipient fascism or about the issues themselves. Jeff Bezos said no to the paper. What does that portend, not just for the Washington Post, but for the country, should Donald Trump win? I think if, if the plan is to count on the benevolence and wisdom and courage of billionaires, that's a bad plan. Um, I think it's a bad plan for any industry. I think it's a really bad plan for any country. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I just, some of the stuff that I've worked on in the past year or so, some of the interviews and stuff that I've done, I just think about a person like Lev Parnas, right? Or a person like Stormy Daniels, or a person like Cassidy Hutchinson, um, Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss in Pennsylvania. I think about people like that, Americans like that, who have nothing, and who have no institution behind them, and who have no one supporting them, no one backing them up. They do not have bodyguards, they do not have protection, they do not have money. And I think about those people standing up and saying, this is a truth that I know and that you all ought to hear about, and Trump and his movement are gonna be very angry for me to be sharing this, but you need to know. And I think about the bravery of those people of those Americans, and then you contrast it with Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, these guys who have more than anyone has ever had in history, and they're so afraid. They are so afraid of losing any tiny little bit of what they have that they're willing to take the, you know, being called and being universally recognized as sniveling cowards because they're so afraid that they might lose some of what they got. And, I mean, you know, Trump threatens to put Mark Zuckerberg in prison, and so then Trump's back on Facebook. And the, you know, Zuckerberg's no longer to do anything that he did before to help a, in a nonpartisan, technocratic way to help with election access. You see Bezos with his multi-billion dollar empires of various stripes, whether it's his space thing with the or the, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, or the, you know, or Amazon or, or, or the Amazon cloud stuff, all, all the contracts, the idea that he might make an enemy of Trump is apparently too much to allow the Washington Post's editorial board to go ahead with their already drafted but, editorial. But it's weird, during his first term, let's, and possibly only term, uh, the Washington Post was a rigorous newspaper in terms of its reporting. It still is. Right, and I, and I, feel, I feel for its staff. I feel for, of which I was a member for 10 very happy years. Yeah. I, that's, that staff has no control over this. No, but the, the, thing that I, the thing that I worry about, David, is that one of the things that I've always told myself is that we choose stories from history that are the stories that we need now because yep. things, that we need, things that we need to relearn or learn for the first time because we need access to it to help us figure out how to move forward now. I also believe that we tell each other stories about morals and character and ethics in order to essentially make sure that we don't fall down on the job, that we, that we hold to our own 
our own standards on those things. And I feel like, you know, in, in a 48 hour period, roughly, we had the LA Times, big city newspaper in one of America's great liberal cities in a blue state, and we had the Washington Post, fantastic, world-class newspaper in Washington, D.C., in the heart of American democracy. And then we had the U.S. Naval Academy, um, within 24 hours of those decisions, cancel a, um, a speech by Ruth ben Giat, who's a historian who focuses on authoritarianism and strongmen, um, who canceled a speech by her after political pressure by a Republican member of Congress. And the, the, reason, it bought, the reason that I find that so unsettling is because the, the, the pinnacles of the American journalism and the U.S. military are both institutions that are very strong, very influential, and very, very self-consciously proud of their patriotism and their independence and their courage and their willingness to speak truth to power. And it is part of the culture of those institutions that that is part of their honor and their nobility, and it's the way they talk about themselves. And so for them to fold in anticipation of Trump resuming power makes me worry about the strength of any of our institutions, and it makes me wonder about, well, what are you going to do once he's there? This is what you're doing just because he might get there. Um, we told ourselves that our institutions are strong, and we've been complimenting ourselves for a long time about, for example, the independence of the Justice Department from political pressure, right? Um, read the history of Bill Barr <laughs> under, under, at the Justice Department under Donald Trump. Our, our institutions are not as strong as we think they are. They're not as strong as they've been saying they are, and it's gonna take public pressure to put steel back in their spines. A absolutely, and I, I, what worries me, <laughs> uh, one of the things that concerns me is that so far the stakes have been rather mild. I mean, the New, the New Yorker published a, an endorsement essay a month ago, it didn't, cost us much. I have no illusions that suddenly Wyoming and Idaho would be sweeping toward the Democratic Party and that they would watch you and read your book and, and change their minds instantly. It was, it, was, it was table stakes compared to so many moral struggles going on. It, it, it indicates to fold on that. Right. Now, you just... It's, it's, not, it's, it's currying favor is what it is. Right, because but it's, it's, a, it's a mugs game. You're currying favor with a guy who's just going to want more and more and more until you're licking his boots on national television. Yes. I mean, what, what you're doing there is you're not saying, wow, the Washington Post is probably going to be in trouble if we publish an endorsement of Trump. What your calculation is there is Trump is going to like the Washington Post if the Washington Post is seen to have pulled its endorsement that was otherwise going to be of Harris. It is trying to say, hey, pick me, boss. I'm on your side. So it's not just trying to avoid uh, punishment. It's seeking favor. Um, and so, so what do you do if you're a reporter at the Washington Post or you're on the editorial board? You, 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 what do you do? I wouldn't, I won't give them advice. I mean, we have seen Robert Kagan and Michelle Norris both resign now mm -hmm. um, at the Washington Post. I think people are going to follow their conscience. I think people are also going to try to figure out how they can do the most good um, going forward. And we all have to. I mean, none of these things are, you know, this isn't a, this isn't a, this isn't a bad uh, fairy tale with an, with an obvious with an obvious right thing to do, where you just need to follow the path, right? I guess, I guess the question I'm trying it's, to get at is what, what we can ask of ourselves and, and what, I hate the term, but ordinary people can, what can be expected of them. Um, a few weeks ago, The New Yorker published excerpts from the prison diaries of Alexei Navalny. Yeah. You interviewed Yulia Navalny uh, just recently. Navalny was already a hero of dissidents and the potential of Russian democracy. He had escaped poisoning and, and, and recovered, thankfully, in a, in a German hospital and could have stayed in Germany, could have visited his daughter at Stanford University where you went, could have had a decent life and still gone on social media and done what he was going to do about you know, democratic principles about Russia. Instead, he got on an airplane and went back to Moscow knowing full well that the chances of him getting arrested and probably being imprisoned and dying in prison were 
astronomical. Very few of us can expect that of ourselves or, would, or, or certainly of our, our, our loved ones or, or, or anybody in this auditorium. What can we expect of ourselves? In other words, if Trump wins, and it's not just a kind of shambling, autocratic, postmodern authoritarianism where really not that much gets done, but it's actually the disaster that I'm afraid I agree with you that you describe. What can we expect of ourselves? What do you expect of yourself? What should I expect of myself? Rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> well, what Navalny said, if you were going to boil down Navalny's message to the people of Russia, it was, don't be afraid, which is sort of an anodyne expression um, in the abstract, but when you put it in the context of his biography, when you put it in the context of a man who knew he would be killed, who knew he would never step foot on free soil again once he stepped foot in that airport, um, and his message to the very end is, do not be afraid. That, to me, is a bit of a clarion call that your fear is, is, is not helpful to anyone, and the power of the authoritarian is your fear. It's a conscious choice to not be afraid. And ultimately, these authoritarians, their message is based on a lie, right? Trump is not going to be your protector. The people who make you uncomfortable or disagree with you are not going to disappear. There isn't a secret cabal that, that we can scapegoat and blame for everything. Immigrants aren't go doing something about immigrants, locking up tens of millions of people in camps, is not going to do anything about the price of childcare. If it is going to do something to the price of childcare, it's not going to be what he expects. There, there, this, it's based on a lie. And what Navalny did in his career, the reason that Putin had to kill him, is because he devoted himself to making Putin the right size. The organization that Navalny headed was called the Anti-Corruption Foundation. And what he did is they, made, they did investigations and made expose videos showing the just craven gluttony and corruption of Putin and all of his friends, including all the embarrassing stuff, the golden toilets and the sneaker collections and the weird like private lagoons and la 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 la. Sounds familiar. Yeah. And the, that, to me, that's, that's saying, he's telling people don't be afraid. He's telling people participate in the democratic process. He never wanted to be a symbolic candidate or a token candidate or a protest candidate. Every time Navalny ran for office, he said, I'm running to win because your vote should matter because we're trying to become a democracy and so use your vote. Telling people not to be afraid and then telling them and showing them with his investigative work, showing why you shouldn't be afraid because these guys are pikers. These guys are just crooks and thieves. And nobody's afraid of crooks and thieves. They're disgusted by them and want them done with. And that psychological message of strength and refusing to play their game, refusing to be afraid, to me is what I've learned from all of those regular Americans I was describing that I've been trying to do projects with and trying to focus on and trying to interview and trying to showcase. We're not going to be led here by whoever the good version is of Jeff Bezos, right? Or whoever the good version is of Elon Musk. We're going to be led by regular people, by Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss. We're going to be led by Rusty Bowers. We're going to be led by Liz Cheney, frankly. <laughs> by people who are willing to not be afraid and to act on it and to treat these guys with the disdain they deserve. Opposition matters. You know, I'll just say one, one, one last example here. You know, one of the things that Republicans really considered earnestly trying to pull off before this election was the Nebraska electoral vote thing. Did you guys follow this? So Nebraska is one of the states, Maine is another, where there's a congressional district where even though the state is red, there's a pretty good chance that that one congressional district can award its singular electoral vote to the Democrats if the Democrats are able to, to, to win there. And Republicans thought about trying to get, and actually worked on trying to get Nebraska to drop that, to have it be winner take all, no more single electoral vote from that one Omaha district, no way the Democrats are gonna get an electoral vote out of Nebraska. 
And it was one state senator, a Republican state senator in Nebraska, who said, I'm going to look at this carefully, and I'm going to consider all the options, I'm going to listen to everybody's arguments, and the answer is no. And the answer is no. And I said to my staff at MSNBC, this guy is about to be very famous and they are going to destroy this guy and they are going to ride this guy until he gets in because they've realized that he's the choke point. If they can get him out of the way, they're going to get this thing done. It might be a one electoral vote election. Watch this. And you know what? I was wrong. That guy standing up and saying no, they were like, oh, some resistance. Okay, we'll go elsewhere. Opposition matters. Saying no matters. Saying, when the chairwoman of the FCC got up and said, you are not going to take somebody's broadcast license because you don't like that 60 Minutes did an interview with your opponent. No, Florida state government, you are not going to threaten the broadcast licenses of local TV stations for running an advertisement in, in favor of the abortion rights measure. This is not what the American public airwaves are for. This is wrong. You can't do it, we're not gonna let you do it, and you shouldn't be trying. Chairwoman of the FCC had basically was exerting zero power there, except she was using the platform and the voice that she had to say no. And pushing back makes a difference. Not, not all at once, but all of us doing it makes a difference. Tell me the difference between Nixon and Trump in this. During Watergate, during Watergate and, and we know from the Watergate tapes, the White House tapes during the Nixon period, that Nixon railed about taking away the broadcast licenses of various television stations and doing everything it could to shut out the Washington Post, which was uh, afflicting his, his nights and days. Um, he didn't do it. He didn't do it. Um, and in fact, say what you will, he resigned. Um, this is an entirely different situation, is it not? How does it differ? It differs, I think, particularly now uh, more so than it did in 2016, because in 2024, Trump now has a sort of army of people behind him who sees that he's the vehicle for their cause. And so while the diagnosis was in 2016, the reason that Trump between 2016 and 2020 didn't get everything done that he wanted is because he was either too incompetent to get it or there were sort of adults salted throughout the federal bureaucracy who slow walked and stopped what he was trying to do. In 2024, famously, we all know that they're going to try to make sure that those speed bumps aren't there for him anymore. That they will both know what, they, what he wants to do, have people in place to do it, and they will purge anybody who might be slow walking or, or stopping what he wants. But I, in, in the person of J.D. Vance, I think you get a, a, a pretty big answer to that question, right? So J.D. Vance, I'm a little bit surprised it hasn't had more attention, but he gave a speech recently. There's a huge profile of him in a certain magazine tomorrow. Excellent, okay. very good. <laughs> he gave a speech titled, Universities Are the Enemy. And he's talked about seizing, he's figured out ways, he knows, thinks the federal government can righteously seize the endowments of universities with an eye toward shutting down the universities. His sort, one of his sort of political mentors, um, Curtis Yarvin, the guy who says America needs to get over its dictator phobia, um, he's fantasized publicly about um, how 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 um, exciting it's going to be for developers to be handed the campuses of great American universities because it's really prime real estate in a lot of places. It's going to make for some great condos. Um, Vance has also openly promised that in power, what the Trump movement will do, what the Republicans will do when they're in power, is that they will crush businesses that don't do what they want. He says specifically on the culture war, but he means on everything. And so when, you've, when you're talking about somebody like Vance saying we need to be more ruthless in the use of power. We need to get way out there, way beyond what conservatives have been willing to do. Let's start by seizing the universities and crushing businesses that aren't on our side. I mean, Nixon helming a beast like that, I don't think would have resigned. But that's the movement that has built up over time. All these people who said they hated Trump, they didn't like Trump, Trump was Hitler, Trump was all these terrible things, they're all on board now, not because they've, <laughs> they think Trump has changed. 
but because they've changed. They now see that he'll get in and break the system and they can do what they've always wanted to do. He's their, he's their vehicle. You've done a lot of reporting on and, and commentary on the relationship between, an alleged relationship between Putin and Trump. You look back on that reporting, you look back on the Mueller investigation, um, how do you see that relationship now? Is it any different than you saw it some years ago? Not at all. Um, in 2016, Trump's campaign chairman was providing information, pub non-public, private information, proprietary information from the campaign to a Russian intelligence officer. In 2020, Trump brought in his personal lawyer um, to work with a man who's now sanctioned as a Russian agent to try to prevent Joe Biden from being his opponent in 2020 for re-election. Um, in 2024, we've got Russia doing more than they've ever done in the election itself to try to help Trump win, just flat out paying pro-Trump influencers and, and online personalities. Um, the, the FBI is investigating now this new video that's circulating showing um, ballots being thrown out in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Um, FBI is investigating that as a, as a Russian um, operation. The deep fake videos about Tim Walls abusing a kid in his school and about Kamala Harris having killed somebody or hurt somebody in a hit and run accident, it's all Russia. Um, Russian, um, the, the, the GRU has been paying people who have been making, and, and Donald Trump Jr. supporting videos that are about what's happening um, in Ukraine, casting it in such a way that's meant to hurt Harris and help Trump. All, they're doing more than they've ever done while we are simultaneously learning that this time it's not the campaign manager, this time it's not his personal lawyer, now it's Donald Trump and Elon Musk who are in regular communication with Putin himself while this is happening. Wall Street Journal reporting on Friday that Musk has specifically been in touch with Putin, but also in touch with the guy who the US government just named as running the Russian influence operations in our election this year. So, you know, is that what they're talking about? I don't know. I don't I mean, I mean, I don't I don't I don't know what each side is getting out of this, but um if you were if it's you were clear what Putin would get out of a victory, he'd be left alone on Ukraine. Well, he'll get his multipolar world. It's bigger than that. I mean, Donald Trump will take the United States one way or another out of NATO. After World War I, we had 20 years, and then we had World War II. NATO has its, you know, good things and bad things, but it has he been would, 80 years since we've had He would argue he it. didn't the first time. He just wanted them to pay up. He, ask John Bolton, right? Mm -hmm. So John Bolton says in his book that Putin, uh, sorry, that Trump <laughs> said to him directly, to, you, want, you ready to make history today? We're getting out of NATO today. Mm -hmm. He will get us out of NATO. NATO, arguably, the reason that we haven't had World War III 80 years after World War II. Um, we will withdraw from the world stage in the, way that the United, in the way that Trump talks about, which is also what Putin talks about in terms of wanting a multipolar world, one in which the United States doesn't have international sway in the way that we do now. It would be a world in which the dictators of the largest countries are the most important international um, sort of nodes of influence. Um, it would mean that the invasion of Ukraine is the template, not the exception from what the last 50 years have been like. I think it's lights out for Ukraine. I think it's lights out for Taiwan. Um, but I also think that it's America joining the Axis instead of the Allies. Um, and that is, that's not just Putin being left alone when it comes to Ukraine. It's a, it's a whole new world in which the United States isn't, the, the President of the United States is not the leader of the free world, but the United States is not in the free world. And the free world is no longer leading the globe. And that can be done very quickly, especially if Putin's helping it happen here. And if Putin's on speed dial with both Musk and Trump, um, I, 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 just don't, I, I just don't feel like there's a lot of mystery about it. 
um, and I'm happy to take on all comers for anybody who's still mad at me about covering this too much. We, we, we might. Um, there is a chance, despite what's transpired in the last 15 minutes, that Kamala Harris wins next. Yeah. I don't say that in a predictive mode, but rather possibly in a religious one. Um, uh, yes, Rabbi. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's say she does, maybe it's by that one district in the Midwest, in, in, in Nebraska, whatever it is, let's say she achieves 270 electoral votes. No matter what, it will be extremely close, unless the polls are crazy off. And usually when they're off in recent years, they've been off, well, certainly in presidential elections, they've been off and underselling Trump's support. Let's say she does win, though. Half the country, or just under it, will have been for Trump. Will Trumpism, will the authoritarian impulse, conscious or not, fizzle and go away? Or where, where does it go? What happens to it? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to imagine a post-Trump Republican party. And it's hard to imagine Mr. Diet Mountain Dew like commanding the same loyalty and excitement as the guys you saw on the subway, um, uh, what you saw on the subway today, everybody on their way to Madison Square Garden. I, I don't know. I mean, once you've decided that politics and policy don't really matter, Congress is just there to be worked around, um, and the, the sort of whims and impulses of the infallible leader are the way that you're going to um, s sell what you're offering to the American people. It's hard to do that after you lose the guy at the top of your cult of personality. So I don't really, I don't really know how that's going to go post Trump. We, we've the Democratic Party's drama um, in the last six months. I think it's fair to say has been uh, well dramatic. That was a great sentence, but you know what I mean. <laughs> there have been a lot of feelings. A lot of those. Yeah. And did we do a bad job when it comes to? looking square at the aging of Joe Biden? Were we too slow to cover that? Were we complicit in letting that go? Were we wrong in any way? I'm talking about the media, obviously. I mean, I feel like the, the, the operative and most important thing about that as a controversy, as an issue in the moment, was knowing that the choice was President Biden's alone that nobody else could decide for him that he shouldn't be the candidate. He was going to run for re-election or he wasn't, and it was up to him. And people prevailing upon him that he was not likely to win, people prevailing upon him that he did not look to the world the way he looked to himself when he saw him in the mirror, ultimately made him, made the decision that he did. Um, I don't know that there was anything secret about um, what was going on with President Biden. The, had it been that there was something secretive going on, there would have been investigative journalism about it that blew the story open. Instead, it was just what we all saw at that debate. And, you know, he could see the tape as well as we could see the tape. It was something that unfolded, I think, much more in public than we like to remember. It's obvious that, I think it's obvious to who you're voting for and who you prefer to see win. Um, but how do you assess Kamala Harris as a candidate and as a potential president. Did anybody here see Michelle Obama's speech last night? I almost feel like having, did you watch it? Did you see it? Yeah. I almost feel like I don't have anything else to say. That was one of the most affecting speeches and most effective speeches I've ever seen in American for, for politics. For a person who says she hates politics, she's pretty good at it. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, the thing about it is that she is not giving you slogans, you know what I mean? She is telling you stories that are surprising and detailed and true and emotionally resonant at a, at a level that I almost can't handle. I mean, I'm deeply, I was deeply, deeply moved by that speech last night. And I felt like it, it helped me understand more about what Kamala Harris is doing so right in this campaign. 
Because at one point towards the end of Michelle Obama's speech, I actually thought that a, a, a chant was going to break out in the room. There was so much call and response, so much audience reaction in that speech because so many people were so moved by what she was saying in that arena in Kalamazoo. But as she got to the end of it, I thought a, spe I thought a chant was going to break out that was decency, decency. Talking about how it says something about us as humans to choose decency over cruelty. To recognize, sure, recognize your rage, recognize your grievance, but also choose kindness. Choose humanity over scapegoating. And that idea that Harris has not, she's, I mean, she, she, she is joyful. She has brought a sort of human element and fun and sort of nimbleness back into the campaign, both her and Tim Walls. But she hasn't gotten down in the mud. And she hasn't been cruel I mean, when he had the weird thing where he was like swaying on stage for 30 minutes or whatever, the social media posting from the Harris campaign after that was, I hope he's okay. <laughs> which was hilarious, but which is also a great way to handle that. I do hope he's okay. Um, and I don't wish well, I'm on I'm calling anybody. bullshit on him. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do. No, I mean, it's not... Yeah. They want on what Trump is offering is military tribunals headed up by Mike Flynn and then pub, you know televised executions of the Obamas, right? And the proper response to that is saying no, 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 no. You should be the. The proper response to that is, dude, I hope you're okay. And I, I, I really believe that. Why? Because we're not. You don't need like a, a lefty authoritarian to fight the fascist. You need democracy mm -hmm. to fight the fascist. <laughs> and that means I don't want J.D. Vance to, you know, to, to burn in hell or to be, to be hurt somehow for his desire to seize the endowments of American universities. I want him to make that case to the American public in a democratic context where we all get to decide fairly or not whether that's a good idea. And lose. And I want him to lose. Yeah. I want him to lose fairly. Mm -hmm. And I think that Kamala Harris is running a campaign that will fairly and democratically and with heart and decency destroy Donald Trump as a political force. I, I want to... So you're going to be on an election night panel, and I want to know, and you've done this before, the stakes have been high before, but never so high as now. What are you feeling when you're sitting there with the little magic camera there, and you're surrounded by your colleagues? What's in your, um, not just your brain, but in your kishkas? How are you, how are you <laughs> processing this, as they now say? I left my body halfway through the primaries. And I will not rejoin my body until <laughs> Inauguration Day. So after we get done covering Inauguration Day, I will go home and drink and cry, no matter who wins, because I have been holding my feelings at bay. I think, I think this whole crowd's going to join For you. months now, yes. So Beers on, at mine. On, 20, yeah. in the, on election night 2016, um, and you saw the New York Times needles start to waiver, and you're sitting there and you're being a professional, um, what are you feeling, what were you feeling that night, and, and to what degree was it similar to what you're forecasting now? You know, the, on those election nights, there's just a lot to do, which for me is a blessing. Just Pro there's, professionally. Professionally, there's a lot to keep track of. If I'm, you, on, on, on those election nights, if I'm not talking, I'm either listening to somebody else on set talking or I'm listening to the control room about something technical going on. Like, there's just, there's too much to do to get upset. The other thing, though, about me, which is just a, like, I have a screw loose, is that when I, there are, I cry, I'm an easy crier, um, but it's much easier to make me cry about a happy thing than a sad thing. Um, and so, like, I cry when I see people being brave. I cry when, like, I hear the national anthem. Like, I, like I'm, a cry, I'm just a crier. Um, and not a lot of happy, brave things happen on election day. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 mostly it's mostly work. But and that's, do you I have to hold back that emotion? Yes, but 
But that's, but even every time I'm on television, every single time I'm on television, I start to cry or something. Because, oh, a puppy ad, you know. The national anthem. The oh, AT&T look. ad, yeah. <laughs> um, but if the, it, it, when you're on TV and when you're going to be on an election night, is there, are there things that you feel that you cannot say? Well, it's not the place to have a lot of emoting, I don't think. I mean, honestly, on election night, we're doing something very different than we do on regular MSNBC Monday nights, for example, which is that you're, you're coming to us for verifiably true information about something that is happening in real time and you need to be able to trust us. And we're not gonna tell you things that are rumors, we are not going to tell you things um, that are later disproved without us doing a, a fulsome correction about it. You're, you're coming to us for, for factual information about a real thing that we all really care about and you are going to have feelings about it at home, but I am not allowed to have feelings about it on TV. And so I just try to make myself not. Do you seem surprised by this? No, not at all. No, I, I, it, it, no but I have the advantage of the, the wall of pros. There's, there's no camera on me, so if I'm weeping silently at my desk, the reader doesn't see that. Um, the question from the audience, if Trump were to win this uh, upcoming election, and there's many, many versions of this one, if Trump were to win, what can I, the average citizen, do to help our democracy and institutions hold? Excellent question. Um, I know that you all have read this book already, but if you have not yet read um, Tim Snyder's very slim pocketbook on tyranny, um, it's helpful for thinking about these things. One of the things that I found very helpful in On Tyranny was thinking about the kinds of institutions to which you have connections. So are you a professional person? Are you a psychologist or a member of a union or a doctor or a lawyer? Um, are you an architect? Do you, do you ha are you part of some sort of professional guild that has professional standards? You may not think of yourself as being connected to politics, but upholding professional standards in what you do may ultimately be something that the country needs. And so your vigilance about institutions to which you are connected is important. For example, um, Donald Trump is the oldest, um, would, would be the oldest person ever elected president. He has not released any credible medical information about what's going on with his health. He hasn't released any credible detailed medical information since when he was president. Doctors should have something to say as a profession about the non-serious, non-detailed, non-medical information that they're trying to pass off as his medical report, which has no equivalence whatsoever to what we've seen about President Biden or Vice President Harris. Just an example. Um, the legal profession, I think, has become much more um, aware and sort of on guard about what professional standards in the, legal pro in the legal profession have to say to lawyers um, who may be press ganged into the type of anti-democratic work that characterized the last election and likely this next one. So there, th that's just one way to think about it. Um, I also think if you're a person who's relatively safe and privileged um, and not gonna be in the first wave of people who are in the most trouble, figure out a way to offer some of your political capital, your social capital, to people who are in trouble. Volunteer with immigrant groups. Um, volunteer for groups that support trans people. Volunteer for people uh, with, with groups that support um, members of different religious communities that are gonna be targeted. I mean, extending some of your social capital to people who are going to need it can help. And I would also just return to one thing that I said earlier, that, that just being in opposition, just saying no matters. And it doesn't ever matter one person doing it once, but it's one person doing it once millions of times over that ultimately creates the kind of resistance that gives would-be authoritarians pause sometimes. And so make sure that your voice is in support of your democracy and in support of your country and use it. Rachel, I, uh, before we close, I, I can't not ask you this question. So do you know what the top, the, the story on the New Yorker website that's being read the most today? No. It's a profile of Rachel Maddow by Janet Malcolm. Oh. 
From 2017. I, 2017, something like that. Really? Yeah. Why is it being... Because it was put out on the archive newsletter. Nice plug, but there it is. Wow. Um, and I have to... And I, and I miss my friend and colleague every day, one of the most extraordinary writers from the magazine who ever was. But I think it's fair to say that not everybody who was profiled by Janet came out of that experience in one piece. <laughs> Or at liberty. Or yes. <laughs> <laughs> what was that experience like? Uh, it was like being dissected while being alive. <laughs> <laughs> it was living vivisection. Um, Janet Malcolm, God bless her. I miss her terribly. But she is the most intrusive, or she was, the most intrusive person I have ever met in my life. I would make, just making small talk with Janet, and she'd be rebutting me about my own feelings because she could tell that I was saying things that were designed to move the conversation along rather than actually to answer her incredibly intrusive, pressing none of her business question. <laughs> Just quietly, and she wasn't, you know, some people would try to um, leaven that like by being funny or by, you know, not, no, she didn't, there was, she was just calmly cutting, just, Quietly, she's a very small person. Just very, she'd hold perfectly still like and an just like an exacto blade. Yes, yeah. and just relentlessly probe you and hurt you, and grab whatever's inside you that you don't want out, and then would just pull it out through your neck. And uh, I'm almost sorry I asked. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was very uncomfortable. Like, and one of the things she said to me during those repeated interviews, I did a lot of interviews with her for that, and she was just incredulous that I was not in therapy because <laughs> she came she came to believe so deeply in questioning me repeatedly. Although I think she believed it instantly as, with her first question that I was so damaged that clearly I needed to be working on this. And uh, it haunts me still, but I'm still not in therapy. <laughs> Rachel Maddow, thank you. <laughs>